Good afternoon. Welcome to another edition of Student Affairs Shares. I'm Jane Tuttle, an Associate Vice Provost for Student Affairs. Today, our guests are Donna Holtine, who's a Director of KU Parking and Transit, and Jim Schilling, who's a Director of KU Dining. So the topic is parking, transit, and dining. Oh my, kind of like lions, tigers, and bears. Oh my. So I'm going to let Donna and Jim talk to you. If you have questions, please type them into the chat box and we will answer them at the end of the uh, half an hour or so. Thank you for joining us today. And Donna, can you talk to us about parking and transit? Absolutely. Um, my name is Donna Holtine and I am the Director of Parking and Transit and we are in the process of transitioning our, um, our department name to Transportation Services so that we can focus um, attention on all of the, the different mobility offerings that we have for students on campus. And so I'm going to start with transit um, and talk about how uh, the tools that we have to plan um, transit trips. Oop, wrong way. Um, so on every bus and in all of the residence halls and in many of the departments on campus, we have a printed transit guide. Um, the transit guide includes all of the routes, all of the fixed route bus uh, routes in Lawrence. Um, so we work cooperatively with the city of Lawrence to offer um, many, many routes. We cover all of Lawrence, Kansas. The um, guide has a page for every route on campus and then some some mixed um, maps. This map here shows all of the routes on campus. There's a service calendar that shows the days that the buses are running. Um, the KU system runs when KU classes are in session and the city runs all year round. So um, we've got good comprehensive uh, travel around Lawrence. Um, and this, we also have a pull out map of the KU, KU campus routes and the downtown routes. It's a pr pretty handy um, pamphlet to have. We also uh, work with the city to have one website, lawrencetransit.org, where uh, students can go to learn about the system, learn how to ride the bus, do trip planning. Um, so just another, another tool for um, figuring out how to get around in Lawrence. There's an app for that. There's an app, if, as we go through this, there's an app for so many things here. Um, this is called My Bus Lawrence, and it can be downloaded for... Um, iPhones and Androids, and this uh, smartphone app shows uh, shows you where buses are in real time. You can look for your route, see when your bus is coming, or see where, you, where, your, where your bus is located um, if it's not at the stop when you expect it. Um, most of our stops on campus have these timetable uh, frames attached to them on the left. Uh, that shows which buses come to which bus stops and the times that they should be at the stop. And then there's the comprehensive map and the schedule, um, the calendar, so that you know if the buses are running or not. But we also have um, the option of a text service. So all of the bus stops are numbered. And if you text the word trip and the stop number to 41411, you um, will get the next several buses that are expected to arrive, which routes and which buses um, that are expected to arrive at that stop. So um, just a lot of good functionality to figure out how to get around. Um, student fees are also paying for something called uh, Safe Ride, which is a safe sort of taxi service or Uber-like service that's offered to students. Students um, pay for this, so it's uh, free. there's no extra charge. Um, there is an app that can be downloaded, the KU Safe Ride app, and um, it works similar to the Uber app if, you, if you've done Uber at all. Um, and you call for a ride, and they will pick students up anywhere in Lawrence and deliver them to their home in Lawrence. And this runs um, seven nights a week from 1030 at night until 230 in the morning um, when classes are in session. So even if students start with a a car situation or a ride situation with friends. Um, this is also an option to get home safely if plans fall through. We also offer, so we have a campus circulator that runs um, from 6.30 in the morning until 10.30 at night um, on weekdays. But on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights, that circulator extends the service until 3, 3 o'clock in the morning. 
Um, and so, uh, and this is a map of the route and it covers a lot of area. It goes downtown and it covers campus and several of the um, living areas around town. So um, just another safe option for getting around um, without a car. Um, another service uh, called the K10 Connector is available to students. Um, it is not run by the university, but we certainly benefit from it. Uh, Ride KC runs the K10 Connector, which is a fixed route shuttle that runs on weekdays, um, and it serves the Johnson County Community College campus um, and the Edwards campus and the Lawrence campus. So uh, we do sell uh, punch cards for this service in our uh, parking and transit office. Um, or uh, students can pay three dollars um, into the fare box and ride uh, in comfort with wireless and not have to worry about a car going down K10. We offer bike share. Uh, right now we have pedal bikes and we have um, e-bicycles. Um, they're different rates the, um, that, that students can create an account and have um, a telephone app that uh, helps them locate the bicycles. Um, so these are located all over campus. There's an app for that. <laughs> so they can download the app. Um, this helps them locate the bike um, and also unlock the bike. And you can look at your records of you know, how, how um, many calories you've burned or how much uh, mileage you've done on a bicycle. So you're using your phone to find, find the bike scan a QR code to unlock it and then just take the ride and then lock it when you're done. And then finally, um, we offer car share cars on campus. Um, if your student creates a, an account, um, it's a $35 membership fee, but that's all returned in rider credits. So this includes uh, fuel and um, insurance and uh, these cars can be rented hourly. And there's an app for that, of course. So for students who are going to bring a car or already have a car on campus, um, just, just a few facts about um, parking on campus. Parking is completely self-supporting, so it's all, it's all user fee-based. Um, and any car that's operated on campus or parked on campus does have to have a permit. Um, there's lots of rules and regulations that go along with that. Um, and depending on where students live, um, that's what decides uh, the type of permit that a student would need. And I just want to individually go through some of these living areas. Um, Daisy Hill up on Ingle Road. The, if your student lives in these six halls here, the green highlighted parking lots are all of their uh, lot options for the permit that they own. And there is always parking available um, across the bridge, um, especially, but uh, students don't have to drive around in circles. Um, they can always go straight across the bridge and find a place to park. And right now we're undersold in these permits. So um, if your student says they can't find a place to park, uh, they need to, to make sure they know all of their options. And then quickly, um, if they live in Central District, we've got um, these lot offerings for them. Um, since Oliver is closed this year, they, they are enjoying a uh, wealth of parking there. Um, GSP and Corbin is um, probably the most crowded area that we have. And so their overflow parking is uh, the yellow lot 94. Um, GSP and Corbin is built on a hill, so it's, it's a little bit harder to carve out parking spaces um, in this area. The scholarship halls, um, at the time that the scholarship halls were built, uh, students didn't have cars or many students did not um, afford cars. And so over the over the years, we've um, eked out as much parking as we can carve out in different lots around there. So there's a lot of different places that uh, scholarship hall students can look for parking. But again, um, there is there should always be enough parking there. And then in Jayhawker Towers, um, these are the lot offerings for Jayhawker Towers, and and I can tell you that they are um, there is always open parking there. And then students who live, freshman students who live off campus are offered a park and ride permit. Um, and the park and ride permit is served by high frequency shuttle buses. And um, there's plenty of parking there for your student as well. Every lot has a sign at the entrance to the parking lot. 
uh, that gives the hours of restriction and the type of permit that your student would need to have to use that lot. Some of these lots do open up at night at five o'clock. Some of them don't open up until 7.30. It's really important to read the signs. Um, tickets are expensive. Um, so I think if they do nothing else, if they read a sign as they're entering a parking lot, uh, they should be good to go. And finally, we do offer um, some hourly parking lots. Um, all of the parking garages can be paid for hourly um, and some of the big surface lots can be paid for hourly with an app called Park Mobile. Um, a student can just create an account on Park Mobile, put in the zone number and pay by the hour to park in, in lots. So they don't necessarily have to have a parking permit. And um, this is just information about uh, contacting with questions. All right, we're going to switch from Donna over to me. Hello, student affairs fans out there in cyberspace. <laughs> My name is Jim Schilling, and I'm the director of KU Dining Services. KU Dining Services is a uh, subsidiary, if you will, of uh, the Kansas Memorial Unions, and we operate all of the dining operations here on campus, of which there are 23. I'm going to say KUDining.com several times throughout this presentation so that you will make note of that and go there to check out even more information than what I will share with you here today. But to start with, KU Dining plans, how do they work? So let's talk about our plans as they are new this year uh, and different from what they have been in the past. We have declining balance dining plans now. And if you have a student living in residence halls on campus, they will have chosen from the gold, silver, or bronze level plan. If you uh, have a student who lives in an on-campus apartment or is an off-campus student, as well as faculty and staff, the 425 dining plan is an option for those individuals as well. Uh, they can also choose from the gold, silver, or bronze, but the 425 becomes an option. So the dollar amounts of those plans are the money that students have to spend in dining services across campus. One note there in this screen is any student with a dining plan, gold, silver, bronze, or the 425, save 15% off of all of the prices in our retail locations across campus, of which we have 20 and then our three residential dining centers on campus, they uh, receive a reduced rate to enter into those for an all-you-care-to-eat meal. So one thing I'll note here is the question will be about dining plan dollars rolling over from the fall semester to the spring semester. Yes, all unused dining dollars do roll over from fall to spring on every plan. If at the end of the academic year, there is still money remaining on your student's account, there are two things that you have as an option. One, if a plan is selected for the next year before the end of the spring semester, which this year will be May 17th, a portion of each one of those plan levels can roll over to the fall plan. And that includes if your student selects a 425 plan, if they're moving off campus, for example. If they do not do that and there is a remaining balance at the end of the spring semester, that money would be forfeited. So we want to make sure that your students are using their plan to its fullest extent. Declining balance system, what does that mean? So when you have a plan, the, your student's KU card is loaded with a lump sum of money at the beginning of each semester. So if you have the gold plan, uh, $2,205 is loaded at the start of the fall semester, and that amount will be loaded again at the beginning of the spring semester, including any rollover dollars that might exist from fall to spring. All 23 locations on campus is where the dining plans work at. Those dining dollars that are the component of the plan work everywhere. So students can not only eat all you care to eat in one of the residential dining centers, but they can go to any retail location on campus, like Chick-fil-A or Brella's, where our world-famous crunchy chicken cheddar wraps are sold from, and get 15% off of every purchase in a retail location on campus when they use their dining plan. I want to stress again that uh, 15 percent off benefit of having a dining plan used at all locations on campus so all of our coffee shops on campus as well too they will they will get that discount using their dining plan there kudining.com 
has a wonderful page with a map of all of our locations on campus, as well as a listing of all operations hours. They are open Monday through Friday, starting at 7 a.m., most of them, 7.30 on the weekends for some of them, and we have operations that are open until midnight, seven days a week. That is a great location to go as well to look at menus for all of our locations on campus. And one option there uh, is you can go to a site called Net Nutrition that links directly from our website where you can see all menus that are being served across campus and look at ingredient lists and nutritional information for every item that we have in all of our locations. So when you have a declining balance plan, budgeting is an absolute necessity to stay on track and ensure that you're using your dining dollars wisely. On our website, kudining.com, we have several tools that are available. You can see an image of a fall semester chart that would show declining balances for students to maintain as approximates to make sure that the money they've got on their plan lasts until the end of the semester. Additionally, online, there is a link to the KU Web Card Center where students can go and set up alerts on their account to notify them uh, when they reach a chosen threshold on their dining plan. And additionally, if you have a plan like the 425, for example, and need to add more funds onto that, you can. You, there's a link to how to do that as well, too, as all of the plans can have additional funds added to them if, if necessary. One more plug for faculty and staff and students who live either off campus or in on campus apartments that a 425 KU dining plan is available for everyone who is not living in an on campus residence hall. That gets you that same 15% discount on all retail purchases across campus as well as entry into all you care to eat residential dining centers for uh, a meal if you're, if you're extra hungry that day. So check out KUDining.com for more information on that. And thank you very much for your time. Look forward to any questions that you might have and some more information there and email if you have further questions about dining plans, diningplans at ku.edu. Thanks. Okay, we do have some questions that came in um, regarding parking and dining. Um, the first one goes to parking. Um, how do you appeal a parking ticket if you receive one? So uh, if you receive a parking ticket, you have 10 business days to appeal the ticket. Um, the ticket does have to be paid before it can be appealed, but there's an online form at our, on our website, parking.ku.edu. Um, so you can just write in the appeal and the ticket number and submit it online. The next one is for parking. Um, how do students know where to park on campus? Um, when a student purchases a permit, we send a, uh, a receipt that's just a verification of their purchase. It tells them what they purchased um, and it includes a map that shows all of the zones the permit that they purchased is valid in um, and a lot of other information about um, how to get around on campus and park on campus. Um, the next one is, I'm visiting my son in the residence halls, um, but where can I park on campus? If you're visiting your son on a weekend, so after five o'clock on Friday, um, through Monday morning at 7, you don't need a permit to park in the residence halls. Um, if you are coming during the hours of restriction, which are Monday morning from 7, 7 in the morning Monday to 5 on Friday, um, I would have your student buy you a visitor pass. They're $2. Um, he would need their license plate and um, need your license plate and um, just pay the $2 and get a permit for you. A couple more for parking. Parking's kind of <laughs> the main factor here. Um, so my son lives off campus. Where can I park um, when you come to visit the campus? Which I think you just answered that. Yeah. Yes. If, if off campus? Um, if, if the son lives off campus, where um, where can he park? Oh, if a, if a student lives off campus, um, I, I would first say take that bus. <laughs> if you're on a bus route, take the bus. The bus is already paid for. Um, you could, they can park hourly in the garages, so you don't have to have a permit for that. And we do still have some parking meters scattered around uh, campus, um, but I would say, or, or they can pay the hourly um, through Park Mobile in some of the bigger parking lots. Um, but if they live off campus and want to regularly park on campus, I would suggest that they uh, purchase a permit, and they can do that in the MyKU portal. There's a parking page in there, and they can uh, pay for it with a credit card, or they can um, bill it to their student account. 
This is the last one for parking, and we'll move on to dining. Um, so when you come to a football game or basketball game, um, where do you park? Um, generally, the uh, athletic corporation um, reserves most of the parking around venues for their donors. And so um, all of the parking lots around, uh, say, the football stadium um, are reserved for donors. We do have some toll parking lots on the south side of campus, and we run shuttles that are free. Um, the, there, there is uh, a charge to park in the lot, but the shuttles are free, and they run two hours before the game um, and then uh, 30 minutes after the game. And then for basketball, um, again, that parking that's proximate is reserved for donors. So um, we, we sell uh, toll parking in the Central District parking garage, and we also run a shuttle from the park and ride lot for $3.00 per person round trip. So um, that's a really easy way to get to the game and then um, be dropped off out of traffic after a game. And the next ones are for dining. Um, do balances carry forward semester to semester and year to year? Yes. Yeah, so if there is a remaining balance at the end of the fall semester, that will carry over to the spring semester. If there is a balance left at the end of the spring semester, one of two things will need to happen. Either that balance would be forfeited if there is if there is a remaining balance that, that nothing has been done with. Uh, additionally, a signing up for a plan for the fall before the end of the spring semester, including a 425 plan, will enable a portion of the remaining balance to be carried over to the fall for saving some of that money that might be left. And then... Um my daughter requires special nutritionist needs. Um, is there a nutritionist who can help my um, daughter with her allergies? Yes, we have a registered dietitian on staff who is there to serve students and assist with any dietary needs that they have. And we, we are able to accommodate uh, dietary needs and, and restrictions based upon medical requirements almost 100% of the time. It is very rare that we will not be able to meet needs, but we do have a dietitian who will meet with students and help them learn how they can still dine with us on campus. And a couple more um, uh, questions for also about, about buses and also for dining. Um, for dining, um, what if your daughter, my daughter can't make it to the dining center within the hours that they're open? Again, the plans that we have enable students to eat at all 23 locations on campus with their dining plans. So the thing that we encourage students to do most is eat where you're closest to so that if you're not able to make it back to a residential dining center, there's most likely a, re a retail operation that's closer to where that where you are at and go ahead and eat there. Also, students can get to-go meals and each of the residential dining centers has a retail component of their of their facility that is open later hours, 11 o'clock and midnight in our two largest dining centers, for example. Um, so let's just go to uh, transportation. Um, so buses are crowded. Um, do buses really pass waiting students if they're waiting for their bus stop? Um, we have had buses have to pass students. Usually these are on the high frequency shuttles. And so I would suggest um, if you run into a situation where you're getting past with regularity, um, it, I know it's tough, but I think uh, if you get up a little bit earlier and take the bus right before that, some of these shuttles run every six to eight minutes. Um, so there's usually a shuttle right behind. Um, I think the problem sometimes is if it's really crowded and you're counting on it, you know, to roll out of bed and get to class uh, at the last minute, you might need to do some planning to get up a little bit earlier. Um, how late do the buses run? Um, during the week, we have buses that run till 1030 at night. Um, and then on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we're running until three in the morning. And then how late does a safe ride run? Safe ride runs from 1030 at night until 230 in the morning. Um, and that's Monday through Sunday. Well, I hope you learned a lot about parking, transit, the bikes, dining, uh, anything else. This concludes um, transit, parking, and dining. Our next presentation will be in early December, and it about it'll be about students coming home for the break. Thanks for joining us today, and thank you, Don and Jim, for being here. Thank you. Thanks.